forms. Sorry Oops. about that. Let's okay. start your answer again. Okay, uh, so talking about yeah. increase in cyclone activity uh, leading to um, ripple effects downstream. Yeah, so the, uh, um, so I was referring to was when uh, we have these tropical cyclones that are in the Western Pacific. So if you think, uh, you know, an area kind of near uh, Indonesia, Taiwan kind of thing, as those cyclones uh, recurve back into you know, the mid latitudes, it's what's called a tropical to extra tropical transition. And studies have shown that as that, as those tropical cyclones, you know, uh, what's called recurvature, so they just, you know, their path just takes a curve, um, it can set off these waves in the atmosphere. And we can't really see them directly like we can ocean waves, but we can see the effects in things like wind and temperature. Anyway, so when those waves set off after a couple days, they can cross the Pacific to, you know, the Northern Pacific kind of off our coast and um, they will, uh, you know, break and cause uh, these high pressure anomalies to occur somewhere in the North Pacific. So um, there have been a study that showed that under a specific set of circumstances, um, these, way, uh, these high pressure systems are about three times more common uh, when we have a tropical cyclone than otherwise. So what was brewing in the Pacific a few days prior to our anomalous heat wave? Yeah, so there was this uh, tropical cyclone uh, called Tropical Cyclone Champy, and it was kind of, um, it wasn't a um, particularly strong cyclone, but it was there, you know, it was a legitimate, um, uh, you know, legitimate tropical cyclone, and uh, so that is possibly a, a precursor to our pattern, and so with these you know, what it does is it sets off these Rossi waves and basically um, modifies the distribution of high and low pressure systems in downstream in the Pacific. And so um, you could kind of think of it as it uh, um, modifies the, the waviness of the jet stream, you know, in kind of a simple way. And where you have like um, a ridge in the jet stream, you tend to have, um, you know, that's where a high pressure usually sits and then where you have a trough, a low pressure usually sits. And, you know, uh, the troughs are associated with storms and cooler weather. And then the ridges are usually associated with sunny weather, sunny and warmer weather. And um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so it modifies the high pressure system off our coast. And previous heat waves have been associated with a specific high pressure system that sets up in a specific location off of British Columbia and Vancouver Island. And so it's kind of exquisitely placed to, um, you know, give us the conditions that lead to the heat wave. So in our case, in this current case, is this high pressure system was way stronger than anything that's been um, recorded before. Uh, so a lot of the 20th, 20th century, depending on what station you look at. And so it was really, you know, that's really still an open question is why it was so strong. And when we talk about strength, um, to somebody who uh, hasn't studied anything related to weather, how do you quantify strength? Are you talking about, oh, that was a 596, damn, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, in the atmosphere, um, when we talk about high pressure systems, so we could talk about different vertical levels in the atmosphere. So oftentimes we talk about highs and lows. We talk about the surface pressure. So that would be like if you had a, um, you know, barometer or pressure measuring instrument in your hands. A lot of us have those on our iPhones and whatever. Um, you know, we can see that a pressure is, you know, high or low with that at the surface. Um, this one, uh, for this uh, particular um, event, the, uh, it was useful to look at basically the, um, the pressure or the, you know, uh, let me break this out. So basically the pressure is somewhere in the middle of the atmosphere. So oftentimes we look at what's basically called the center of mass of the atmosphere. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're at a part in the atmosphere that's where half the mass is above and half is below, um, you know, that height or, or that, uh, the pressure at that level will um, be related to partly to, or largely to the, um, to the uh, temperature of the layer of atmosphere below it. And so in this case, the atmosphere was so warm that it caused the pressure in the middle of the atmosphere to be really high. And so that's one way we quantify that. And uh, one 
observational way we do that is we use what are called radio sun balloons. So people might be familiar with weather balloons, you know, the big balloon and you get to see it launch and uh, it's kind of fun. They're fun to launch. Um, but um, so we use those to, we have a, a large network of stations across the U.S. One of them was in, um, you know, there are a couple in British Columbia. There's one off the tip of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington and um, that's launched twice a day. And that weather balloon, uh, th that weather balloon launched actually um, measured the highest pressure at that level that we had ever seen before. And so what it was is indicative of basically the strength of the, the ridge and the um, amount of uh, heat that was built up in, within it. Yeah, I understand there were some records broken just looking at, you know, um, soundings at, you know, 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet and, and, yeah. and so on, like temperatures we'd never seen. Before. Never seen. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was crazy. And I've, uh, I've said this before now, um, I think it's a great point is that, you know, when the weather forecast models, you know, 10 days ago were predicting, they actually did quite well in actually predicting the strength and extent of the heat wave. And when we saw this, uh, you know, these, the strength of this high pressure, um, you know, it was, it was much stronger than anything we'd seen historically. And it was so early in the season that, you know, we thought, man, those models are really off. They're really wrong. Can't trust those. And if you see the weather service forecasts um, over the last 10 days, you know, they were forecasting maybe 95, maybe 100 for Portland. Um, just until about one or two days before the event. And basically what we kept expecting was that the forecast models were going to, um, you know, kind of uh, change whatever was wrong with them would kind of change um, as we got closer to the event. And that never happened. And, um, and you saw what happened. We did experience largely what the models predicted. I was, I was shocked. Yeah. I mean, I had a coworker come to me about a week out and said, Hey, it's going to be 104. I'm like, oh, is that what your phone says? Yeah, you know, exactly. I'm making fun of it. <laughs> that was a, that was exactly right. Yeah, weather savvy people are like, you know, don't look at your your little Apple weather app. Go to the weather service website, and you know, you go there, and you know, it turns out that uh, you know they were uh, they um, they underestimated the strength of the heat wave. You know. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I heard some people also early on refer to it as an omega block. Would that be a fair description? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think it was more of a rest block, but uh, other people say it's an omega block. So I think there's a fair, um, I, I think either is a fair description. Um, it doesn't, I think in the coming months, we'll probably debate a little bit about whether that was a significant distinction um because the and the distinction was the omega block it basically the high pressure if you look at the pressure contours on a map it draws out the great global uh, letter omega and uh, rex block is where you have a it's you have a high pressure and then to the south you have a low pressure and we kind of had that situation it was it was kind of weak but uh, or the low pressure was kind of weak but it was um you know, it was there. So for a while, it was probably a Rex block, but you call it Omega block. Um, I think in a research setting, we generally call those more uh, um, just blocks, um, atmospheric blocking episodes. So it can refer to a class of systems, either an Omega or a Rex, or that, I mean, there are other couple types of blocks too, but um, yeah, so that, I think that would be fair. Um, and I don't know if you have this info handy. If not, we can, you know, just uh, get it later. But um, at the the height, the peak of the strength of our high pressure, what were the measurements? Uh, the measurements of um, the strength of the high pressure or the strength of the which which strength or just um, yeah at the at the five hundred millibar level. Okay. Um, let me real quick look up. So I'm actually uh, at my work computer. I've been working at home, so my uh, all my my systems a little um, not set up here, right? So I will have to search for a for a second. No problem.
Shoot, my uh, the website as you get this at is um, I got to remember how to get there because I have it just set up our, already at, at home. <laughs> Sorry about this. No, no, no problem. So, uh, So it broke the record twice. The record before was the all-time record. So the uh, uh, Chew It um, radio sound station. So that's on the uh, tip of the western tip of the Olympic Peninsula. And the 500 millibar height, uh, the record was at 5970. And um, it looks like during this event, it set uh, two records with the same um, height and the last one was set on da, 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 on um, June 27th I'm sorry June 28th and that was at 5980 okay. so I think um, I mean we could look at other stations too because there were records broken for a number of stations um, or I'm sure they were. I'd have to actually do just a tiny bit more of um, searching for what the record was and what it, what the number ended up being. Yeah, that's <clears> fine. <throat> we can um, we can you know uh, get into that later when I'm actually putting this piece together. Okay. Um, I'll be talking to Kathy tomorrow, okay. so that'll be awesome. That'll be good to get a, some uh, info on her research that she did. Uh, Less than ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've been working on uh, amplifying that paper a little bit because it was a really useful messaging piece um, to give con historical context to the kind of heat waves we've had in the past, and it was a really good contrast for this current heat wave uh, because it was so anomalously strong. Yeah, I mean, it's a wake up call, I think, to all of us. Um, especially for those of us who study this and um, we're responsible for warning people, hey, this is coming up. Um, is this climate change breathing down our necks? Uh, yeah, I think um, the short answer is yes. So the, you know, we do have heat waves. Um, it's important to note that there are, we have had heat waves and other extreme events um, in the historical data record. So um, you know, there have been times we've gotten up to 105 or whatever. But it, this one was so um, strong and, you know, it, it came about by a pattern that usually causes other heat waves, but this one was just supercharged. And it was really that 
piece of it, um, the, um, the fact that it was so strong, that is an indication, I think, of uh, climate change, um, you know, cl climate change contributing to it. So basically, as the climate changes, um, it changes our weather patterns, it changes the baseline temperature, and, um, you know, it also, yeah, and it changes the conditions from which these heat waves um, manifest themselves in. So, um, yeah, so we are now in an altered climate, and um, so this is kind of, you know, having this sort of heat wave that would have been hot in Phoenix is uh, definitely a, um, a sign that we're seeing the effects of climate change. You know, we, we thought that kind of these big impactful events, um, we would not experience these for another couple of decades. You know, when we wrote the Oregon Climate Assessment and um, some of these other papers, you know, it's the research has, has shown that, you know, we're gonna start to see these gradually into the future, but the observations now are showing that we're actually experiencing these um, high impact, high intensity events now. So uh, the evidence with the Labor Day fires and now this, um, there are a few other events too that uh, seem to be, you know, have some climate change, possible climate change fingerprints. So in the coming uh, years, there's gonna be a lot of research, I think, on this particular event and the conditions leading up to it. So hopefully we'll be able to say more definitively, you know, sometime soon, you know, we'll be able to attribute, you know, the exact uh, cause, you know, why climate change did this. Right now, we're not quite able to do that. We have some ideas, but, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, no one knew to study uh, the possibility that it would be 115 degrees in Portland, Oregon in June. Um, that was just, that was so outlandish, they would, that would never have gotten funded, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. Well. <laughs> Here we are, um, and in Canada, did I read uh, just in the last, what was it, six or eight hours, um, they had come up with a new record, was it 121? Yeah, yep, yeah, in Canada. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it, is, it, is it true, and, and this is like another number that was thrown out there, and I'll, I'll have to go back and, and double check, but um, north of uh, 50 degrees uh, latitude, uh, north latitude, um, that would then be the highest recorded temperature anywhere yeah. on, the, on the planet. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so that's um, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. And you know, we've seen clues to this though in Siberia um, the last few years, and especially this past year, uh, they've had a lot of uh, record high temperatures, like north of the Arctic Circle. You know, uh, temperatures in 80, 90 degrees, uh, things like that. So we've seen clues that this was hap You know, this sort of warmth was you know permeating into the high latitudes, you know, these Arctic and subarctic uh, places that, um, you know, they have permafrost and, uh, you know, they have uh, solid sea ice in the wintertime, things like that. So, it, yeah, this was, yeah, this is just incredible. Off, off the charts. Um, and do I understand correctly that um, when, when we refer to this as, you know, a heat dome, mm -hmm. um, that we typically see that, let's say, across the desert southwest. Okay, fair enough. Um, but since we are in this, the, the state of the drought that we're in, does that attract heat domes? Um, the, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, the short answer is uh, that it doesn't necessarily attract it, but it does, um, it, you know, it does contribute a little bit to the intensity. So in our case, we're in, you know, the second year of uh, severe to extreme drought, especially in Oregon, uh, not quite as much in Western Washington, but in, you know, Oregon, uh, Eastern Washington, parts of Idaho, we've been in this extreme drought. Uh, soil moisture conditions are very dry. Um, vegetation um, is drier than normal, much drier than normal. Um, and, you know, evaporation off the landscape is uh, kind of a, a negative feedback on heat. So as you get hotter, you get more evaporation, which can keep the surface a little bit cooler. So um, being in these drought conditions, we didn't have that, um, you know, that cooling mechanism to, uh, you know, to kind of maybe keep the temperature down a couple of degrees. So that was, that was probably a contributing factor, um, although not a major one uh, at this point. Okay. Um, so to, to give people an understanding, you know, when, um, when we, it's so hard to simplify climate yeah. change, right? <laughs> really, right. really hard to do. Um, but uh, just if I can use the most simple terms, like um, 
climate change is experiencing the extremes of everything. It's not just heat, right? Yeah. We know we have greenhouse gases, we know that creates heat, but, or traps heat, but, but the, it's the extreme of floods, it's the extreme of, let's say, snow events, it's the extreme of, you name it, the list goes on. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So the, uh, yeah, we're seeing this in the, the data record now, is that our extreme events are getting more extreme. So in the Western US and in Oregon, the primary concerns are droughts and um, heat waves. Um, we are also concerned about, um, you know, extreme rain events and things like that, although that probably isn't going to resonate very well right this second. But, you know, we do ex expect, you know, some of the, you know, more extreme precipitation events um, and things like that. So basically climate change will set the table for these extreme events to be a little bit more, uh, a little stronger or to be stronger um, in the future. And, you know, we thought that, you know, this sort of, that we wouldn't see this in the data record until, you know, further into the future. And we're seeing it now in Oregon. And oh, I guess another thing that uh, climate change can make more extreme are wildfires too. Um, and wildfire risk, so. Uh, yeah, we, we have one going right now in Dufer. Uh, I think it's up to 2,000, or excuse me, 10,000 acres when I last checked. Yeah. Um, granted, that's not all that big when you consider the fires that we've uh, had in, in the last uh, 365 days, but um, yeah, already seeing this now. Um, then you add just a little touch of wind to it, and here we go. Although the the kinds of winds that we had Labor Day last year, that that in itself was an anomaly. Do you agree? Yes, I was. Yeah. So we um we actually wrote. Oh, you heard about the paper in the talk yesterday. So yeah. So the, um, those were um, anomalously strong. It's not clear that that was uh, you know a consequence of climate change or if that was just really bad luck. But the combination. So it wasn't the strongest winds we'd ever seen, but it happened at the worst possible time when the landscape was the driest. Um, and actually at that time, if you remember correctly, um, going into that, we actually had a very similar high pressure dome, heat dome, that was in the same, you know, a very, almost the same exact place as the one we just experienced. Uh, there were some slight differences in this, in a distribution of highs and lows that um, in that event that made the wind strong that we didn't, fortunately didn't have during this event. So, uh, so we got, I would say we got lucky in this um, in this one, even though this happened early in the season. If it were to happen, this would probably be the time for it to happen, uh, the better time for it to happen. But in the last event, going into that, we actually also had a heat wave. Um, if you probably remember that we were uh, we had upper 90s or 100 degree temperatures. It wasn't as strong as this one, but it was you know it was more of a typical strong heat wave for the Pacific Northwest, if there is such a thing. <laughs> um, and when the fire came. Um, you know, there was smoke everywhere and that knocked down the, the sun, the solar warming of the surface. So that kept us from maybe, you know, getting up to, you know, 105 degrees or whatever, which was one forecast for one day. Um, and, you know, it kept it down into the 90s. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, no problem. Yeah, yeah, just talking about, you know, these these anomalous events by themselves and then when combined with the other anomalous events. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah, it was definitely a combination of the of the strong winds, uh, the the drought going into it, and then the, the so extreme dry atmosphere. So that the atmosphere was so dry, and when it gets, the drier the atmosphere gets, the more moisture it tries to pull out of uh, the soil and any fuels and vegetation that are present. So um, the combination, those that combination of three variables, um, that was why that was responsible for the the fires, yeah. or that was, those were the weather conditions responsible for the fires. So there are other mm -hmm. management and ignition questions. <laughs> so there's the triad of wildfire risk. Mm -hmm. So that was just one leg of that stool. Yeah. Um, so uh, back to the ocean, um, what, what, what about sea surface temperatures and that, that contribution to um, big, strong ridges of high pressure setting up over yeah. the Pacific Northwest? So um, that's an interesting question. And actually, uh, I'm also doing some research on that um, with a graduate student or a couple of graduate students on looking at the relationship between um, these high pressure events over the North Pacific and the underlying temperature. And it's still an open question whether um, the ocean 
you know, causes or contributes to that high pressure or if that high pressure causes the sea surface temperature to be warmed. And then if there's some sort of feedback between that. Um, it's still an open question. Some people have uh, jumped the gun a little bit and said, oh, warm sea surface temperatures cause the, rid uh, the ridges and there's no evidence for that. Um, so right now it's still, uh, we're still trying to understand what that interaction is. So right now we don't have a good, um, good answer, at least from my perspective. Uh, so and nothing in the literature really, um, there really isn't a clear uh, convincing evidence that, you know, the causality is, you know, which direction the causality is. So um, I think, I mean, we do have some evidence that it's more of the atmosphere the high pressure ridges cause the sea surface temperature anomalies. And uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of like direct feedback between uh, you know, these events, but you know, we might not be looking at it right. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, so right now I think that's still an open question. Any correlation between ENSO phase and the times that we've had these heat waves? Um, there is a weak correlation, but um, it's not, uh, it's nothing, to uh, so during kind of um, more of a moderate to strong La Nina phase, uh, we can we have a tendency to get some of these ridging in the high in the North Pacific a little more often, but um, the correlation is kind of weak, and there are lots of exceptions. So it isn't a it isn't a fast rule, and the idea is that maybe you know one hypothesis is maybe the Enso phase can be. Uh, affecting tropical cyclone activity, which can affect this Rossby wave propagation into the North Pacific. And so maybe the, the mechanism is, is through that. So there's, um, but yeah, uh, from my perspective, um, there isn't a clear, like I didn't, I didn't say, you know, I didn't see this heat dome and say, oh, that's something I would expect from, you know, the winter or the summer after La Nina. Um, so. And actually, right at this time, uh, the, the ENSO, it's, we're in ENSO neutral conditions, so we kind of were in La Nina during the winter, and then we've kind of uh, gone to kind of neutral conditions, and then the projection is for perhaps La Nina to redevelop uh, later this fall. So right now, there also isn't a clear uh, temperature signature in the ENSO phase, at least, that we can um, use as a guide to try to understand what happens. Seems like moving forward, it's going to be really hard to draw or connect any dots if we're having these, you know, unusual events that haven't happened before. Yeah. You know, you, you can't even say, oh, yeah, well, you know, La Nina, that happens. It's like, well, actually, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is such a good point is that, um, you know, as the climate's changing, um, you know, when we look back, so typically to understand the earth, one of the things, you know, to understand weather and climate patterns, things like that, is we go back and look at historical data. And, you know, which is a very logical thing to do. So we try to understand, you know, why heat waves were here before, um, you know, why high pressure heat domes form and all this stuff and, and what the actual physics are behind that. And um, with this event and others like it, around the globe are showing us is that um, the past may not be a guide, is not going to be a guide for understanding the future. Um, although it's still important, um, you know, so we're gonna rely now more on, you know, climate model simulations um, and things like that of the future to see, you know, what these, you know, how these patterns are changing and what the, what the mechanisms are. And is there any clues since, you know, of things like ENSO phase and stuff that can help kind of guide us to prepare for such events or forecast them or anything like that. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, during this event, forecasting it on a professional basis was really difficult because there was no analog. So we couldn't go back and say, you know, hey, this heat wave behaved like this in, you know, 1992 or something. And so we expect this heat waves kind of follow something of a similar pattern. Maybe it'll have its own um, personality, but you know, um, we can at least kind of base a forecast off that. So right now, um, you know, there's a little bit of fly, you know, there was a little bit of flying blind. Um, the weather service did not know how warm to put the temperatures. You know, they had the model guidance, but it was so unrealistic. Um, even during the event, it's like, we don't even know how long the event will last. You know, it's like, 
we have a heat wave that would last two or three days, maybe four, something like that. And the models were suggesting it's gonna last, you know, maybe we'll have a slight lull now, but maybe it'll last another week or 10 days. In Eastern Oregon, it's, it's still going full, <laughs> it's, still, uh, um, it's still going full steam. And, um, and we don't know whether the forecasts of its duration are going to be accurate or not. Just don't know. Yeah, I think I heard uh, that they, uh, that perhaps I know they have to verify this with, you know, some, you know, uh, different agencies, but um, perhaps one, was it 118 or 119 that for the state re uh, record for Washington? Um, yeah, in the, in the Dallas. Yeah, um, so, so I, I'm actually, I was actually asked to be on part of the committee to, um, I don't know, to uh, just, or, uh, you know, make that record of, you know, official. So there's, uh, there's some, um, through the NOAA uh, NCI, um, they have some, um, you know, something in their charter that says that, uh, you know, when you have a, a, a large number of events, especially like state records or things like that, that, you know, People go out and um, check the weather station, check the surroundings, um, you know, evaluate the, you know, the conditions. Is there anything, you know, did somebody park their car by the weather machine? You know, those sort of things um, to see if that was, you know, uh, you know, if there was any indication that that reading was not uh, representative of the actual temperature. So, um, yeah, so in the coming weeks, uh, there'll be some more, um, some more news about that. <laughs> For sure, about, about how it's, uh, you know, it'll be an official, you know, um, record, you know, state record high or something like that. What about, what is Oregon's state record high? It was, uh, I believe, um, so there've been a lot of numbers flying around. Um, so it was uh, 118 in, uh, there were two places. One was Hermiston and one was in Pendleton. And I believe those were in 1892. Um, let's see, let me, Real quick, double check that. So I don't know if this is a, I mean, I don't know if these are uh, like official, <laughs> okay. but um, the one climatolo climatology site I go to, um, it's actually saying Hermiston or Umatilla set the record in 1930, July, 1939 at 117. Um, and I think the Hermiston 1898 record was um, not 18, I, it wasn't 1892, it was 1898. It was 118 and uh, that is not considered official. Oh, okay. And um, to be honest with you, the anything bef like <laughs> before probably 1930 or stuff has to be taken with a slight grain of salt. Although for climatological purposes, we treat those as the same as, um, you know, contemporary types of records because that's all we have. Sure. So. Is there, um, do you imagine anywhere in history, I don't know, let's go back to the 1500s for fun, um, that we would have experienced a heat wave 
as we just did, but of course there was no way to really document that or record that kind of information. Is that possible? Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, it is so, uh, you know, very careful we quote records to say it's the highest on record. So just what we've measured. Um, so a lot of people like um, some of my Twitter stuff, I've gotten, you know, things from people saying, oh, we had, you know, ice ages or, you know, the ice age or something. We had, you know, thousands of years before it had to have been hotter. And um, it's not necessarily, I mean, we have no evidence that it was, but um, statistically speaking, you know, there is a possibility that maybe something like this occurred and we just obviously weren't there to measure it. Um, but there's just no, um, no record. So on the flip side to say, that yeah, it was possible that we didn't, that we could have been warmer, had a heat wave that had a, a warmer temperature. On the flip side, we also could have never had that too. So it goes both ways. So this could have, this, you know, it's also the same possibility that we could have had, not have had um, as hot a temperature. We just don't know it. So. And that's no reason to dismiss like, hey, we need to pay attention because yes. Heat is the considered the number one killer, right, of all That's weather right. events. And you know the so that that does, um, so that discussion I actually am not um, the discussion of whether we could have had a hotter temperature sometime before, um, you know, sometime before we started measuring this stuff. That's not as interesting to me because just from what you said is that we've built a we built a, a society here in the Pacific Northwest that was. Um, based on a particular set of climate and weather conditions. And, you know, a lot of Pacific Northwest is a rainforest. Um, we don't get heat waves like this, um, this strong. And we're not, you know, as a society, just we're not prepared for it. So, um, you know, you saw a lot of the images of the roads buckling. I showed one example yesterday in the talk, or Monday in the talk. And, uh, you know, so a lot of like our engineering design parameters were, were, you know, when the engineers said, what's the temperature range we should build buildings and roads for and, and infrastructure for, they say, oh, build it, it's never going to get hotter than 110 here. And if it does, it'll be one day and things, you know, it's, you know, that's what you should do. But then we get 115 degree temperature and then all those, you know, roads buckle. Um, I've heard things about, um, you know, other, infra other types of in infrastructure at a hard time. So some of the power lines, some of the, uh, you know, um, infrastructure associated with the power delivery system um, failed. And, you know, fortunately it was kind of, you know, minor and localized, but um, we saw, you know, the fact that these things weren't designed for this weather. We saw evidence that things started failing at that time. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't have air conditioning. Uh, a lot of the medical centers, you know, were not prepared, you know, they did what they could, but they weren't prepared for the influx of patients. Um, you know, we have agriculture and livestock uh, production that, um, you know, is built around a certain temperature range. So right now in Eastern Oregon, there's gonna be this crisis that's ongoing right now in the fact that for several days in a row, it's been over 110 and, you know, people have cattle and things like that. So the cattle are uh, experiencing high mortality rates, uh, a lot of crops in the grounds that should be harvested eventually, you know, in a month or two are, um, are drying up and um, not growing correctly. Um, what are the things? Yeah, so all this, you know, kind of all of our, all of our stuff, you know, just a lot of different elements of our society that we depended on having a certain, um, you know, a certain climate, you know, are starting to have trouble or they're, they're uh, experiencing you know, stress and vulnerability. And, um, and it's a really important point that, you know, going into the future, we're going to have to, uh, you know, one of the direct consequences of something like this heat wave, one of the, one of the long-term effects is that we're going to have to start to design our society to account for these sort of events. So, um, you know, in this, well, in the coming weeks, it's going to be, uh, it'll probably be more of a discussion around this, you know, our national discussion on infrastructure and um, you know other things, both at the state and the federal level. And of course, we have to. This is also will bleed into the international uh, negotiations about you know 
what should international society do to mitigate or adapt? And you know, what kind of cooperation and um, do we need among various nations to have a coordinated effort for this? Yeah, I, I think there's probably plenty of people out there who are like, okay, well, I got myself an electric car this year, yeah. or you know, we are composting, or you know, they're doing their little part. But God, if we don't have everybody on board, like, yeah, yeah. it's. You know, yeah, it's like uh, the scale of the scale of what we're facing um, for it to adapt and stuff. I mean, it's I think it's hard to wrap your mind around it. It's hard to wrap, for people to wrap their minds around it. Um, and you know, I think this is really an important reason. So I don't come into this with an agenda, or you know, and I usually like to keep politics out of it. But you know, having you know, considering uh, you know impacts and implications of climate change on infrastructure i think it's a you know i mean it's a very natural thing to have um you know as we're discussing the infrastructure bill um you know and, and some of these you know some of these climate change or climate mitigation or climate adaptation components of that bill um you know that's why they're in there is um you know is because of this you know we have extreme weather event it's not a you know oh this is this is neat kind of thing. This is, we have an extreme event, uh, you know, things, parts of our infrastructure start failing because they weren't designed for it. A lot of our infrastructure is old, antiquated. It was built for a different time. Um, you know, so, you know, it's kind of a natural thing to think about in conjunction with that, with the experience of these events. You know, the wildfire, the extreme events, the extreme heat wave and then also you look at different parts of the country you know the southwest is or i'm sorry the southeast the gulf coast uh, the you know the extreme rain events associated with tropical storms um you know the tornadoes and and thunderstorms some of the more extreme events that have happened in the midwest uh you know some of the snowstorms you know the early snowstorm we had in the denver you know in the front range of the the rockies um that was associated with that weather pattern we had that caused our wildfires and it caused this weird extreme event in September in a place that you wouldn't expect. It is wild. Um, any kind of last words, you know, uh, tidbits of knowledge or can you send, can you send the folks listening or watching in a direction so they can learn more and educate themselves? Yeah. Um, so because I have a kind of a regional focus is the state climatologist of Oregon. We do have in Oregon, um, every two years, uh, we have a small amount of uh, support from the state to put together an Oregon climate assessment document. And so if, if you wanna learn more, at least on um, what our analysis of like climate projections and some analysis of um, the historical data and you know, you kind of see how climate change is manifesting itself in Oregon and things like that. And so that's a good document. It also has some really nice sections on impacts on public health and on the built environment. And it's designed as kind of a, a higher level summary. And then it gives some, um, you know, if people want to learn more about it, it has uh, references to other uh, really good work and really good papers um, to look at. So that's one resource for at least the you know, the Pacific Northwest or Oregon um, that I can give. Uh, so this is the first time I've actually gotten this question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you've, uh, uh, so this is good. So I didn't prepare um, it, everything for it, but the, the, the climate assessment is good for uh, more information like that. Is there, is there different kinds of information that might be useful for the audience that's yeah, I, I think like, you know, may, maybe it's along the lines of, you know, preparation, it, you know, if you are, if you are a farmer, it, let's say you even have a small winery, you know, we, oh. we just did a story yesterday on it, you know, a nice family farm where all the raspberries were totally <laughs> beyond baked. And they're like, what do we do with, oh, we can make jam. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what, uh, what, what are those family oriented, you know, um, businesses, like how can they prepare? Yeah, that is actually a very good question. Um, the so one thing I'll say is is there's not a lot of um, uh, there's not a lot of information right now. Um, I can um, I know one or two people I can ask if if they might know uh, they might have a better answer. So I I guess the my short answer is I probably don't have a very good answer to for that. And but I could try to find out for you. 
Um, a little bit, just slightly answered, and it's a point I already make, and I'll just make it again, is that, um, you know, this, the climate model projections were suggesting that we were still, you know, a couple decades away from this, and so, but now we're seeing them now, and this is kind of a little earlier than expected, even though we knew more extreme events were coming now, but that, you know, maybe they weren't going to get this bad um, into the future. So I think, um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, a lot more um, emphasis put on, you know, adaptation strategies, which I think is what um, you're asking about, is how do, um, and this is a big question, is how do, um, you know, how does society, you know, the different parts of society, so there's, you know, there are these, you know, these specific examples you gave, which are great, and then there are others, you know, about, you know, like tourism industry, um, you know, I mean, there's obviously uh, the economy, you know, various parts of the economy, but then there's our agricultural livestock production, our water infrastructure, so are things like dams, rivers, you know, how do we operate the, um, you know, our water storage and stuff like that, and um, right now that's all, uh, that's, I, my sense is that's all still in the process of being, you know, people are still wrapping their heads around the magnitude of the changes um, with that. And so I honestly don't know, you know, I mean, there's definitely people trying to prepare for like public health aspects and starting to prepare for like, you know, the changes of in infrastructure we need. Um, but I don't know if there's like a big document that actually lays out the specific, you know, specific things that we need to look out for, but I'll, I'll look for that. Okay. That's a very good question, so. All right, that is, that's, that is good stuff. Um, and um, do I remember correctly, did you say um, we're, we're two years into our uh, uh, severe drought status? Correct me, I'm, I'm probably messing that up. Nope, oh, that's exactly right. So this current drought basically started in, you know, the fall of 2019, where we had a blocking ridge high of pressure, if you remember, right? Uh, so we kind of, I, I kind of colloquially refer to it um, as a, the ridiculously resilient ridge. And this was something that uh, actually Daniel Swain coined in one of his papers, uh, 2017 or 2014, um, to describe a similar ridge that um, that formed in the North Pacific that actually affected the, you know, the 2014-15 drought in California and the Pacific Northwest. This drought, you know, started kind of with that, and we haven't recovered yet. So, um, you know, each year, um, as the drought goes on longer, um, the, you know, the precipitation deficits compound um, in the impacts. The impacts keep getting worse as we deplete groundwater supplies. So the, you know, surface groundwater supplies that kind of uh, supply stream flows and dry land agriculture, um, things like that. Um, you know, it takes a while for those for that uh, moisture to build up, and then it takes a while for it to go away. But once it goes away, the impacts of the drought become a lot more severe, and that's what we're seeing this summer. Is that the drought is a lot more severe because we didn't recharge those resources. You know, um, we did get a decent snowpack, but a lot of that, um, you know, it wasn't enough to, like, um, you know, for it wasn't enough, um, you know, because it snowed in the mountains. So if you're in eastern Oregon, away from the uh, snowmelt dominated watersheds, um, you didn't feel that. And so a lot of central Oregon, the Klamath Basin, things like that, um, their reservoirs, groundwater supplies are, you know, very low. Um, they're not enough to meet the needs of, obviously not enough to meet, meet the needs of the communities there or the, you know, the agriculture, uh, things like that. And then, you know, the, as far as wildfire risk, the fuels never, um, got really damp during the winter time. And so um, they're drying, they're, they've dried out earlier in the fire season. So this is why we're seeing that such a high fire risk now is that they just, we just didn't get a recovery, a moisture recovery during our wet season that was sufficient to um, absolve the, um, you know, the drought from last year. And then we got less rain than normal this year, again, quite a lot less. And then we had the super dry spring, the second dry spring on record, and uh, so that's all compounded the drought impacts and the drought severity. Yeah, um, kind of makes you want to drink. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so it's bad. Too. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, 
pictures of uh, Mount Hood uh, last night. I was looking at it right before the sunset, and um, I was like, oh my God, Palmer Snowfield is disappearing. Yeah. And that's, um, so Mount Hood actually got more snow than normal this year. And, you know, it, so, and then basically in the droughts we have, usually Mount Hood fares the best. So we thought, okay, well, we don't have to worry about that watershed, you know, um, the bull run or anything like that. And I don't think we really have to, like, I mean, there's no um, indication that the municipal water supplies will be short in Portland or anything like that. So no need to do that. But the yeah, you know, the heat wave melted a lot of that snow off. So if we get another dry year next year, then maybe next year, um, you know, there isn't the glaciers and things on uh, Mount Hood to keep those, um, you know, to store some water in and things like that. You know, maybe they'll be depleted by a lot and, the, and then the stream flows that drain off of Mount Hood will be lower than normal and then the reservoirs downstream and the lakes and ponds and whatever will be lower than normal. So it's something to keep an eye on is, uh, we have to have a good wet season next year. Um, if we don't, um, next summer is is uh, is going to be really bad. So um, last year, I didn't say that because you know we there was still some carryover um, this year, not everywhere, but there was still some carryover in the reservoirs, and you know it's still a little bit of groundwater. But if we don't get something, um, yeah, this this story next year will. Um, yeah, be even worse. Okay, well, um, last question for you. Um, is cloud seeding out of the question? Yeah, it's uh, cloud seeding. Um, the essentially it's been very expensive, and the there seems to be in some specific conditions, um, you know, you can get a little bit more rain out of, you know, a cloud, you know, maybe 10 to 20% more, but uh, that amounts, so the cost benefit analysis of that, it's very costly to do. We need to um, do a lot of seeding. Um, it doesn't work for all clouds. Um, it doesn't work for all conditions, um, you know, um, and, you know, you might end up throwing billions of dollars into something that with relatively little payoff. So, um, yeah, so that, I think, you know, my opinion of that is that it wouldn't be a good idea. There, I think there are other reasons not to do it too, but yeah, I think, and I, I've heard that too from some people. It's like, oh, we should start seeing the clouds and things like that. And it happens every, every bad drought is, you know, you see all these heavy clouds, but no rain. And you're just like, oh, if they're just, you know, just something a little we could do or something, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, it isn't going to, um, it isn't going to, have it'll be a drop in the bucket more or less for um, what we're facing. You know, the thing about cloud seeing too is you don't know exactly where that rain's going to fall. We need it to fall certain places and it's really hard to <laughs> get it there. Um, and some of what we're facing too is the fact that the weather patterns have altered to such an extent that the storms are either weak or they don't come. So there are not that many clouds to seed in the first place. So yeah, uh, yeah. gotta have that part. Um, okay, God, I feel like I could go on and on, but I will let you go on with your day here. Um, if there, if you're able to um, send me um, links to um, uh, climate models that I that the public can access, um, that would be really interesting to follow and learn more about. Okay, link to uh, climate models stuff here. So, um, do you want like the yeah, so there's, um, I can send you one. There's uh, there's kind of a, a nice page that we call the Climate Toolbox. And you seem pretty savvy about all this stuff. So you've probably heard of it before. But I can, um, I'll put the name in the chat. And it has um, some basic, actually it's really nice plotting tools that you can look at various, um, either historical data or um, some of the climate model projections. Um, and you could pick like an area or a point or whatever. And you can look at things like precipitation, temperature, um, you know, some, I don't know, a few other variables too. And it's really nice. Um, I, I spend so much time on this uh, website for drought monitoring stuff and other things. Um, so, okay. um, but it's easy enough to use, I think, <laughs> for somebody that's like, you know, maybe uh, 
not per, you know, maybe slightly more advanced. Um, it sounds like you would probably have a lot of fun on it. <laughs> okay. uh, might be a good resource. So uh, that's the one I would, um, I would put you on. So there's, um, there are other ones. There's also um, one called Climate Engine, and it actually uses some of the same data um, that the Climate Toolbox uses, but it has more access to a lot more stuff. Oh, yeah. I have a bookmark that I just look at the URL and it has a nice URL. Climateengine.org and it's a, it's a little bit, it takes a little bit, that one takes a little bit more practice to use, but um, it's not inaccessible to um, somebody who's really excited about it. So, um, and that has actually a lot, a lot of other data sources too. So, but they also have some climate model projections from CMIP5. CMIP6 will be there soon. Um, and uh, so you can, you know, kind of make graphs and figures and stuff. And you can even download the data if you so wish. <laughs> cool. I like it. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I okay. seriously appreciate it. Um, if there are any, um, you know, based on our conversation today, any uh, graphics or anything visually that we can show to illustrate, um, you know, our topics today, that would be extra helpful. Um, certainly for the blog and um, and our our podcast network um, that's kind of in its infancy right now. Um, they expressed interest in the story as well. Okay. So um, yeah, any anything that we can uh, throw in there would be super awesome. I'm trying to get this wrapped up, <laughs> maybe <laughs> by uh, Friday before I take vacation. Um, okay. And while this topic is still <clears throat> hot. Yeah. <laughs> get it out there in the public um, because I feel like, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, if it's not, you know, blazing hot, people will be like, oh, that kind of sucked, but oh, well, moving on. <laughs> uh, the, unfortunately, the narrative is very likely to shift from heat wave to wildfire. Um, yeah. So, uh, exactly. yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I will do that. Um, I actually, my time is kind of limited to, there are a couple ideas I have that of something to do, but I, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to do it. So I apologize if I don't send you anything, but I'll, I will try. Um, so I have it on my list of things to try to do. So I'll try to do something, but um, if I can't, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I just appreciate all the time you've given me today. Um, this has been super insightful. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't uh, lead you astray or um, if you want clarification or anything, or if any, I know some of the things I've said are confusing and whatever. So if you need any more clarification or if you need um, more specific numbers with uh, uh, a uh, source you can point to, let me know too. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll do that. That sounds good. I'm going to stop.